Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for Beef Symposium today. Uh, Dr. Jessica Gordon is an assistant professor of rumen and health management at the Ontario Veterinary College. Jessica grew up in Michigan, where she obtained a bachelor's degree in animal science, and then later a doctorate of veterinary medicine from Michigan State University. After her DVM program, Jessica practiced food animal medicine in central Wisconsin. Her passion for teaching brought her south to the University of Guelph for her doctorate of veterinary science in rumen and health management. Since graduating, she has been working as a professor in the Department of Population Medicine at OVC. In her position, she enjoys teaching rumen and health management and handling in all four years of the veterinary program. Her research focuses on health management in beef cattle with emphasis on anti-helminthic anti resistance and antibiotic use and resistance. So welcome to Jessica. Thank you, Ira, for that introduction. I'm just going to start sharing my screen here. And um, as, as you all will know, I'm going to be talking about vaccination pro programs for cow-calf producers today. And I just have a few, uh, a couple of polling questions to get to get us all started this morning. So James is going to run those for me as well. So just wondering, do you currently vaccinate animals on your farm? Either yes, you vaccinate all of them, most of them, some of them, or no, you don't vaccinate any of the animals on your farm. Give people a couple more seconds to respond. Okay, if you wanna go ahead and close that one. Thank you. So a nice majority vaccinate uh, all of the animals, which is awesome. And then we have sort of a even split between the other groups. So if we'll go on to the next polling question. If you do vaccinate, what do you vaccinate for? So respiratory disease, abortion, and clostridium, calf scours, some combination of the above diseases or none of the above? Just give a couple people a couple more seconds to respond there. Okay, if you want to go ahead and close that one, please. So most people are vaccinating for a combination, some combination of the common diseases that we see, and I'm sure that's going to vary farm to farm. Great. So we'll just get started with the presentation now. I can close it. There we go. Um, so I'm sure it's it's odd for you all to sit in front of a computer screen and watch people talk. Um, it's really odd for us as well, because we're sitting in these um, empty offices just speaking at a, a computer computer window, which is interesting, but such are the times. So we'll go on um, speaking about vaccination programs for cow-calf producers. Um, you can see my contact info there. You can find, find me on Twitter, though I am a very sporadic tweeter. I will tell you that very right at the beginning. Um, if you are on Twitter, please do follow us at U of G Beef Research, where we share um, information about uh, ongoing studies or results from studies that we do in our group. Uh, and you can, can catch all those exciting things we're doing um, there. For some reason, hold on. There we go. So I want you to think to yourself, what causes disease in a beef animal? And that's a very open-ended question, but really this is the question that we need to get to the root of to determine what are we gonna do with vaccination programs in cattle? So this can um, come in the form of specific diseases. So you could be thinking something like BRSV or BVD, but it, becomes something much broader than that when we think about this on a holistic or whole farm sort of approach. And so when we take the entire um, 
animal and environment into consideration, we basically have this triad that causes disease. And if you've ever watched epidemiologists give a presentation, it's like a requirement that we put this somewhere in our presentation. So we get paid, you know, based on that. So here it is for you today. So we do have our host resistance. So what the animal is able to, um, what the animal is able to respond on their own. Um, the environment, so things like how clean it is or what the temperature is, that sort of thing. And then the agent itself. And the agent and the environment come together to determine what the pathogen load is that the animal sees. And all three of those things come together to determine whether or not an animal experiences diseases. When we think about these three things, we can think about things that we have control over for, versus things that we don't particularly have control over. And so if we think about that triad, we have really no control over the agents that are um, that we see. Certainly we can, ex we can do things like exclude diseases from farms or from areas, and you can see that in some control programs. But as far as the individual agent, um, think of it like the coronavirus that's in the, out in the population today, we have no control if that coronavirus um, mutates or um, you know, becomes more, uh, more contagious, that sort of thing. And it's the same thing with animal agents. We really don't have control over those things. What we do have control over is the ability to enhance an animal's immune system. So we can do that either with um, specific things or we can do it with more general things like nutrition. And this just decreases the risk that a particular animal will get ill and increases the dose of an agent that an animal has to see before disease develops. And then we can also reduce exposure to the disease agent. So decreasing um, the probability of adequate contact between individuals. So basically things like um, you know, decreasing our stocking density, decreasing mixing, um, making sure our nutrition is good, just reduce it, can reduce some of these exposure uh, experiences. So when we look at enhancing the immune system in cattle, um, we're going to go through some very basic immunology here. I am not an immunologist and I don't claim to be, but there are some things of the Im immune system that we really need to understand. So we have specific immunity and we have non-specific immunity. So in the picture um, by non-specific immunity, you can see there's a calf in nice green grass, um, nice and clean, uh, good weather. And so things like that, um, that just overall enhance the health of the animal also will improve the immune system. So nutrition, cleanliness, um, just the environment that the animal is in. And then we have specific immunity. So when we're looking at specific immunity, we have two basic parts of that piece. And one is passive immunity. So that is the immunity that the calf gets from the dam in claustrum. And so making sure that those calves get a significant enough claustrum and that the claustrum that they are provided is good quality and as well as um, active the active part of the specific immune system. And that is where we vaccinate the individual animal and get them to have a immune response on their own. So what's the point of vaccination? And that might seem like a really stupid question, but we wanna know like, why are we bothering doing this? And I mean, the obvious thing is that we want to present, prevent disease in a particular individual. And absolutely that is a piece of vaccination. But what we know is that no vaccine is 100%. And so even if we vaccinate every single animal on our herd, the likelihood that um, one of those animals either is not gonna respond to the vaccine or that is gonna be faced with a challenge that is more than the vaccine can handle is relatively high. And so we also use it to prevent disease in the group as well as potentially decreasing the severity of disease if an individual animal contracts it. So I'm sure in the news and such, we've heard lots and you've probably heard it through uh, cattle stuff before as well, but you think about herd immunity. 
So all of the words here on the slide are really not important, but it's just what's the number of the susceptible individuals in a population? And then what's the probability of adequate contact between those two people? So if you have two animals that have a disease, but they never come in contact, then the chance of spreading that disease is basically zero, even though um, those animals are infected. So to put that in a bit more visual of an example, so here we have our herd of cows and they're all green, which means that they're all immune to whichever disease we're talking about. And obviously, again, this is really just for illustration. You never anticipate that 100% of animals would respond um, ideally to a vaccine, or if they all do respond again, that there's still a chance that they can, they can contract the disease. But we're saying that 100% of our animals respond to the optimum level of, of one vaccination. And so if we have disease come into the herd, the disease has no animals, that are susceptible and so none of the animals get disease in this case bvd and we do not see that disease set up in the herd if in, instead of everyone being um, immune we have one black animal here down at the bottom who is susceptible and again if we have disease come into the herd but that particular animal doesn't see that disease then we're not going to get we're not going to experience that disease in the herd. If instead we get BVD, in this case, coming in at that particular animal that is uh, susceptible, then that animal is going to become diseased or red. But as that animal sheds the virus, there's no one else to get ill because everyone else is protected. So we don't see development of disease in the herd as a whole. If we go beyond that and we increase the number of animals that are susceptible, so in this case we have two susceptible animals, again we have BBD entering the herd at the bottom left through that black animal, that animal gets ill but we don't have sufficient contact between the two susceptible animals, we'll still only end up with the one individual animal that is sick. If instead those two animals, now the two black animals one next to each other, have sufficient contact, then all susceptible animals that have sufficient contact will end up being sick or red, but they won't be able to spread it beyond the, those two animals. And as we increase the number of susceptibles in a herd, or we increase the chance that two susceptibles are going to spend a sufficient amount of time in contact to spread disease, we increase the chance that we have disease basically set up and spreading um, across our herd. And so that's why we want to make sure that our herd as a whole is protected so that we can decrease the chance of any disease transmission or setting up disease in our herd as a whole if we should have one individual animal that comes down with the disease. So the question then is, can vaccinated animals get sick from the disease or diseases that they're vaccinated for? And the answer is absolutely 100% it is possible. Some vaccines are better than others, um, but you can always override a good vaccine if you put enough pathogen in their way, basically. So vaccination is to administer a vaccine Immunization is actually to stimulate that immune response. So when we go and give a shot, we're hoping that those two things are the same, but they don't necessarily mean the same thing. So if I give a vaccine to an animal, that is then on that particular animal to develop that immune response, to develop those antibodies and the, that cell medi mediated immunity. And if the animal doesn't, then I have vaccinated them, I have given them the injection, but they're not actually immunized. And so those two things can be the same but aren't necessarily exactly equal. It is really important when you're thinking about vaccination to think about the different claims um, on the bottle. And so like who likes reading a big insert on whatever disease or, um, drug or vaccine you're, you're bringing in, but 
it is important that someone do that, whether that be you yourself or whether that be your veterinarian in um, helping you develop your um, your vaccination program, because what is on the label is affects how likely it is that that vaccine is going to protect those animals from disease. So in Canada, um, with the CFIA, that is the body that um, approves vaccine use in Canada, there are these six different levels of basically how good does that um, does that vaccine prevent or help control a disease? And you can see that's all the way from for the prevention of, so that would be that most of the time animals are gonna actually be prevented from getting that disease to as an aid in the reduction of clinical signs where the animal's gonna get the disease, but they're just not gonna get as sick as they would have otherwise. And so knowing where your vaccination stands um, in, in that sort of continuum helps you just be really cognizant with your ideas of how good you think that vaccine is gonna, gonna work for you, or you know, do you need to think about something else or some other vaccine? And so this is um, gonna be really small writing, particularly if you happen to be on a, a cell phone, but I will bring out the important pieces for you. So this is a label and I do not endorse any particular um, brand or uh, type of vaccine at all, um, but this just happens to be a label from Bovashield Gold um, 5, BL5, so this would be, um, an appropriate type of vaccine for a mature or a cow herd. And so you have, in this case, it actually says that it is to prevent persistently infected calves caused by bo bovine virus, diarrhea virus, um, types one and two. And then it's to aid in preventing abortion caused by IBR um, as well as BBD and then um, aid in prevention of respiratory disease in the herd. So it is more likely, or the, the vaccine does a better job at preventing PIs than it does at preventing abortion or preventing respiratory disease is what that comes down to. If we compare that to a vaccine for foot rot, um, this label claim is just that it helps um, reduce the clinical signs. So it's an aid in reduction of clinical signs of foot rot, which means the animal can still easily get foot, foot rot depending on your man management style. And that just the severity of the disease in vaccinated animals should be less than that in unvaccinated animals. When we think about vaccine failure, so the first thing, um, you know, you, you go out to a producer and they're, they're having problem with the disease and um, we all just love to jump and vets are terrible for it too, but jump on, oh, maybe the vaccine isn't working or maybe the drug you're using to treat that disease isn't working anymore and we're seeing resistance. And we got to step back and think about if we have an apparent vaccine failure. So we have a case where we are getting disease in animals that potentially should be, or we think should be protected. What is causing that? And there's basically two um, halves to this. So either the vaccine was given incorrectly. So you didn't give it in the appropriate route. We didn't store it properly. Um, this is really can be really common in particularly in very large herds that are trying to vaccinate a large number of animals at a time. So if you think about running your whole herd through a chute um, and having the vaccine sitting out, that vaccine really needs to be refrigerated. And particularly if you happen to be running them in the fall and it happens to be a very hot day, that vaccine is inactivated relatively quickly. So we need to think about storage of the vaccine, not only between vaccinations, but also in the process of vaccinating. Um, if we're going to be taking a, a relatively long period of time to vaccinate a group of animals. And then um, did that vaccine, um, if you have a live vaccine, did we actually inactivate or kill the, the live portion of it? 
say we did everything correctly. We stored it properly. We um, gave it the right way, all those sorts of things. And then we have two um, route or halves of this and either the animal responds or the animal fails to respond. And if the animal responded to the vaccine, but we still see disease in that animal, why are we seeing that? Well, one is that that vaccine actually, you know, the antigen that the vaccine is, um, is made for isn't protective. So you can think of that like a flu vaccine. They change it every year with the, what they think is gonna be the highest risk flu that year. And if you get a different type of influenza, it's not necessarily gonna protect you from that influenza. Um, so that being like a different strain or potentially it's a different organism altogether. So say you vaccinated for manheimia and you think you're getting manheimia in your herd and, and actuality it's pastorella or it's hisophilus or something else and so that vaccine yeah the animal responded to the to the vaccine but you're actually seeing a different organism causing that disease in your in your group of animals or potentially the animal is already infected and that's probably most obvious when we're looking at animals coming into the feedlot. So most animals that experience respiratory disease in a feedlot tend to do so relatively early in the feeding period and are exposed prior to arrival at the feedlot. If they haven't been vaccinated already they're, um, and they're already exposed, then vaccination at the time of arrival is not necessarily going to prevent disease in those animals that have been exposed prior to arrival at the feedlot. And then the animal can fail to respond in many reasons. One, because the vaccine just doesn't work that well. I mean, there are certainly vaccines that we know don't, don't um, provide a good level of protection. Um, there's differences between animals. Some animals are more susceptible versus less. If the animal was immunosuppressed for some reason, which would be common around calving, um, or if the nutrition isn't quite up to snuff, particularly things like minerals and, and vitamins that help support the immune system. And then if you have a young animal that has passive immunity from the dam, that can block a vaccine so that um, those antibodies that come through the colostrum can actually inactivate a live vaccine. So how do we set ourselves up to be as successful as possible. And one is to make sure you're choosing the right vaccine for your particular situation uh, and for the diseases that you're thinking about in your herd. Make sure you're vaccinating soon enough. So if we think that it takes about two to four weeks for immunity to occur, if you see pneumonia in calves at four months and you're vaccinating them right at the time that you normally see disease, the likelihood that you're gonna see a lot of benefit from that vaccine significantly decreases. Whereas if you did it a month ahead of that high risk time, then you're much more likely to see a benefit from that vaccination. Make sure your animal is healthy enough to respond. So good nutrition, they have enough um, body condition scores so that they, um, you know, they're gonna prioritize basically keeping themselves living and immune system is something that can come or go if they don't have enough stores available for them. And making sure that you are really good about your compliance. So making sure again, that you're storing it, you're transporting it properly. If you're mixing a vaccine, you have a live vaccine, you're mixing two together, make sure that you're mixing it um, appropriately, only putting clean needles into the vial. Um, and once it's mixed, it needs to be used relatively um, quickly. So within a couple hours, making sure that you give the vaccine as it is recommended, as far as route, dose, and how frequent you give it, and making sure that you are recording those vaccines so you know that an actual animal was actually vaccinated instead of, oh, you went out to vaccinate the cow herd, you couldn't catch number 12D, and you forget that you didn't actually vaccinate her and she becomes ill, and then you're frustrated that the vaccine maybe isn't working. And decreasing the risk of disease being brought into your herd by making sure you're vaccinating um, and testing purchased animals. 
And so here is a list of common diseases that we have vaccines available for in mature cows and suckling calves and in weaned calves. And here the big thing is in mature cows, what we're really worrying about is either disease in themselves, which generally speaking is abortion, we're trying to prevent abortion, or increasing their colostral immunity. So increasing the number of antibodies present in their colostrum to protect their calf. In suckling calves, we're really thinking about diarrhea or um, pneumonia for the most part, uh, as well as some clostridial diseases. And then in weaned calves, again, we're mostly thinking about BRD and then other things can come in depending on your particular um, situation. So if we think about the immune system again, we're gonna divide it up in a different way now. So we have an innate or physical barrier. So the fact that we have skin, that we have what are called mucous membranes in our nose and our mouth and in our GI tract decreases the chance that those agents can actually get into our bloodstream and, and make us sick. And the, true is, is the same is true for animals as well. And then we have the adaptive immune system. And that's where we can have some um, we can affect that adaptive immune system. In the adaptive immune system, we have two sides of that. We have our humoral or our antibody system, and we have our cell mediated immune system, which is where those cells in the body actually destroy the viruses and bacteria. And again, the, the adaptive um, part of the immune system is where we can have a response with vaccines. So if we think about killed virus vaccines, the advantage of these vaccine is they generally an, um, have a good immunity. We can give them to anybody. We don't have to worry about potentially causing an abortion in a pregnant cow um, or those cows um, or calves shedding it and causing an abortion in a, a pregnant cow in the, in the herd. So you can do those whole herd annual vaccinations. And if you properly store them, you can actually use that bottle over a period of time. The disadvantage is you absolutely have to make sure that you booster that particular vaccine about two to four weeks after the first one. We do not get a good response after just one vaccine. And they really um, stimulate antibodies well, but cell mediated immunity, it's really much more quest questionable and antibodies aren't necessarily always effective at preventing disease. Uh, because they're a bit more stable and you can use that vial over time, um, they are more expensive and the duration of immunity is a shorter period of time than a modified live. So our other option is a modified live vaccine. The advantage there is that you can stimulate cell mediated and humoral immunity. Um, a single dose in most cases will provide you that um, protection and you have a much more long, a longer um, duration of immunity than with killed for uh, on, in general. Disadvantages, you have to be um, mixing them and then using them right away. And so sometimes that can be a challenge for a smaller herd uh, to have enough animals to utilize those, um, those vaccines. And the other thing is that if you give them to animals that have not seen a vaccine before, you can um, ha you have a risk of increasing, uh, of, of causing abortion in those pregnant animals. Um, I said they need to be mixed already and, and used relatively quickly. And then they can be inactivated by things like in the syringe. So you need to be cognizant of that as well. So when we look at vaccines, um, modified live do both humoral and cell mediated and killed do humoral only. So when we're thinking about modified live respiratory vaccines, we're talking about IBR, BVD, PI3, and BRSV. And you can see some options here that you might recognize from your farm that maybe you didn't realize were, were respiratory vaccines. And those are the common diseases viral that cause respiratory disease. Then we see some um, in combination with some um, bacterial causes. So we can see them with Mannheimia, pus pastorella or histophilus. And so with the viral causes, that would be our most common causes of respiratory disease in cattle. 
Another option for respiratory disease is actually intranasal vaccines. So for viral, we have IBR, PI3, BRSV. and bacterial, we have Mannheimia and Pasteurella options for intranasal. When we think about killed vaccines, so same exact organisms that we're thinking about, just in that this case, the virus is inactivated in some way so that you can give it again to pregnant animals that haven't seen a vaccine before. Clostridial vaccine, um, there's a few options here and we basically see uh, these clostridial um, organisms being included. Um, and I see I didn't put tetani on there, so that's my fault, but there are um, most of our, a significant portion of our clostridial vaccines will also include tetanus as well. And then when we're talking about abortion, we're mainly thinking about IBR, um, BVD, and lepto, um, plus or minus uh, Vibrio. Generally speaking, these vaccines will come with the, the, all of the respiratory diseases in them as well. So PI3 doesn't cause abortion at all, but these vaccines come in a combo with everything. So you could give them to calves and to cows um, just the same. And again, killed is the same exact organisms, we just have those viruses being killed. The reason these are abortion vaccines is because we have addition of those lepto. Lepto does not cause respiratory disease, so if we're really targeting respiratory disease, we don't need it. But if we're thinking about uh, reproductive diseases, we want to make sure that we include lepto with that. And then for scour vaccine, we have rota coronavirus and clostridium, as well as E. coli. And again, these are generally given to the cow to increase immunity in her colostrum. And we actually have an intranasal vaccine that can be given directly to the calf for scours as well. And so that's not meant to be uh, an exhaustive list at all, but just to give you a feel for some of the vaccines you might see in your at your home farm and make you maybe make you feel a little bit more comfortable. Oh, I am vaccinating for that. I see, I know that I've, I've used that um, and, or, oh, I think I need to think about that a little bit more. A note about intranasal vaccines, they're awesome for outbreaks or young calves. They stimulate quick immunity at the mucosal border. So generally speaking, we're talking about in the nasal passages. Um, but if we're talking about corona for scours, then it's actually in the GI tract. Um, and it's a relatively short duration of immunity, but the nice thing is that it's not inactivated by um, antibodies in the blood. So a calf that has antibodies from the dam um, can be given an intranasal vaccine and you don't have to worry about that vaccine being inactivated. It will still provide protection at that mucosal border. Um, generally really limited as duration and it has limited cell mediated as well. And if you think about, um, if you see in the pictures how you need to give this, you need to get that nasal cannula deep into the nostril and you need to tilt the head up so that that vaccine flows back into the nasal pharynx into the back part of their nose. And so that can certainly be a challenge in, in older animals and older calves but in young calves, it's relatively easy to do. So general recommendations for vaccination. So if we think about a calf, we're really thinking about respiratory disease um, and the time to be vaccinating for that is gonna vary based on what you, on your particular situation. So if we think about branding slash pasture turnout, if you happen to have a high risk of pneumonia in your pastures, then absolutely um, consider adding in some respiratory vaccination um, around the time of turnout to pasture. Um, Clostridium is a good option before you turn them out to pasture because their risk is gonna be the highest in that first year of life out in a pasture environment where their risk of um, ex experiencing clostridium or it, it, being um, in their environment is higher. And this is a great time to think about use of intranasal vaccines so that if they do have some protection from the cow, but you want to give that sort of little bit more to try and decrease your risk, then intranasal is a really great option. 
if we're thinking about vaccinating calves that we're either going to retain ownership for or we're going to sell in a, in a special pre-vaccinated sale, what we would like to do is actually vaccinate those calves about a month before weaning. This allows them to develop a protective level of immunity prior to the stressful, extremely stressful event of weaning. So we would rather not wean the animal and vaccinate them at the same time. We want to be vaccinating them prior to weaning. And so things we might think about there, IBR, BRSV, BVD, um, Clostridium, if you didn't give it before, and then things like Menheimia and Histophilus, depending on the calf cell that you're selling in or your particular situation. So if you're going to retain those calves, if those are replacement heifers and you have um, Menheimia in your herd, then you want to really consider that for yourself. When we're looking at value added beef calves, which you'll hear about more next, um, what we've found in studies is that if you look at pre-vaccination, um, generally you will see a premium for that, but most of the premium will come in these special calf sales, and you don't tend to see great premiums in if you just send them through the general sales barn. And so you do need to, to think about that when you're doing it. When you think about preconditioning those calves, so when you add weaning those animals as well, um, you don't tend to see those additional premiums. Now, some of those special calf sales require preconditioning as a whole. And so obviously that's gonna depend where you're selling your calves, what the requirements are, absolutely go with this. For me, a really frustrating thing as a veterinarian is one of the best ways that we could decrease the risk of disease in the beef industry as a whole and decrease our use of antimicrobials is actually to pre-vaccinate these calves before leaving the, the, the um, herd of origin. And the decrease in risk of disease in a feedlot can be between 30 to 85% reduction in BRD. And so if we could bring these two parts of the industry together, we could really work to decrease um, overall disease in our animals. And obviously the caveat to this is that this is a lot of work for cow-calf producers. And if you're not seeing that economic benefit, it's a hard pill to swallow to think about, you know, doing all that extra work and paying for that vaccine. So I get it 100%. It just, if we can work as a, as a whole to bring ourselves in, towards that um, as an industry, then it would be really, really helpful. When we're thinking about breeding age heifers, um, we're thinking about abortion for the most part. So again, IBR, BVD, and lepto, um, plus or minus clostridium, depending on if they've been vaccinated before. Ideally, we'd like to give them a vaccine pre-breeding and give them a live vaccine because we see better immune response with our live vaccine. Um, and these animals have no reason not to have a live vaccine, um, then that would be our, our um, choice. And then for cows, if you think about this as a continuum, so going from calving around back to calving again, um, we have basically three different options for time frames. So uh, again, we're thinking about our abortion causing diseases, so IBR, BVD, and lepto, and we can either give a modified live pre-breeding, a killed vaccine um, around the time of preg checking, or a killed vaccine around just before calving, where we might also be giving a scours vaccination if we calve indoors um, or we have a high risk of scours in our herd. And so giving those two vaccines at the same time might be um, a help as far as uh, your, your um, management goes. So, you know, you have to think about for yourself, like ideally we'd be giving modified live vaccination to everyone but in your particular management, does that make sense? Are you handling your animals at that time period or would it be better for you to give it at preg check? In that case, we would recommend a killed vaccine. Now, modified live vaccines now we are labeled that if they have been given in the last 12 months, you are supposed to be able to give them to pregnant animals without an issue. But some vets have seen issues with abortion after vaccination in herds that have been um, appropriately vaccinated. So really to be super safe, we would stick with killed in any pregnant animal. So the key is absolutely good management. 
get your management in order before thinking about your vaccine or in concert with thinking about your vaccination program because poor management will always override a vaccine 100% of the time. And so it's really important that, um, you know, this is a picture of some animals in a lot of mud. Obviously we have times of the year where that just can't be avoided, but if your animals are always super muddy, super dirty, um, if the ventilation is really poor where they're housed, then their ability to um, mount an immune response is gonna be really uh, decreased. Think about what diseases do you want to vaccinate for? What do you have a problem with in your herd or what do you wanna prevent a problem with? And determine when do you wanna vaccinate and then you're gonna choose what type of vaccine you're gonna use. So again, modified live is generally preferred because it's stronger, gives better immune response, but killed is safer in pregnant animals. Make sure you're handling the vaccines as recommended on the bottle. Use a new needle whenever you enter the bottle. That's really, really important because particularly with modified live vaccines, if we introduce bacteria or anything into that bottle, it will deactivate um, the vaccine in the bottle. So use clean syringes. Um, you can use a multi-dose syringe to vaccinate. That's totally fine. But before you start vaccinating, make sure that syringe is clean and then make sure you're discarding that live vaccine after use. And if you have to mix two things together, then it has at least one live component. And so that's those that are that need to be um, discarded after a couple hours. Make sure you follow your label directions. Don't forget about your withdrawals. And if you're giving more than one vaccine at a time, sometimes this can cause a really significant um, immune response. And so you wanna be a little bit cautious. And so working with your veterinarian, can really help you get through all of these questions. There's lots of great products on the market. And so it can be really hard to choose one. So reach out to your vet. They can help you determine what is the best option for your particular management. And with that, I'll be happy to address any questions that you might have. Well, thank you very much, Jessica. So we do have some questions. Uh, the first question, lots of discussion of COVID variants and the virus. Are we seeing that with any of the livestock diseases, for example, BBD, that would render vaccines less effective? Yeah, so um, certainly we can see some variation um, in, in those, uh, those particular variants of a virus. What we see is that the way that the vaccine is developed, the part of the virus that it is attacking, it is remaining constant across those variants. So no, we don't see a decreased level of protection. Since we added the type one and type two BBD to our vaccin vaccines, um, the vaccines are effective against all of, as far as we know at this point, all of those different variants. So yes, we see variation, but the vaccine is still as effective against those variants that we are seeing. Another question, is there a lepto vaccine that lasts for a year on pregnant cows in combination with a modified live virus? Yeah, so that's a great question because viral or sorry, bacterial vaccines tend to last a shorter period of time. And in particular, lepto protection tends to be about four months. Um, so if you think about vaccinating a cow, like when is her highest risk of um, lepto exposure is obviously during the um, during the summer grazing season. Because right, when I go into it, it takes me right back to the same one. Someone needs to mute, sorry. Um, and so it's, you want to have that high a level of protection during the summer grazing season. The risk of abortion tends to be between a higher sort of mid gestation for lepto. Um, the answer to the short answer to that question, I guess, is no, there's not a lepto vaccine that lasts for a year on a pregnant animal. Um, that is com combined with an MLV, but even the ones that are combined with a kill don't last for a year either. So targeting that um, pre-breeding time um, increases the antibodies present during that higher risk time, which is when they're actually out on pasture. Okay, the next question. What can the veterinary industry do to convince feedlots not to administer antibiotics on arrival 
when the calves have already been vaccinated. It seems an automatic receiving program, a protocol, even if it's not needed. Yeah, and that is a really great question. And this comes down to a very philosophical type of answer. So, you know, you can feel free to totally disagree with me. I, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, so the problem comes to, um, comes between really the industry having this disconnect between the cow-calf industry and the feedlot industry. And with feedlot owners, even if they're purchasing these pre-vaccinated animals, not necessarily believing or um, expecting that it was maybe done 100% perfectly. And so still giving those animals um, antibiotic. And so, I mean, as we start to work together more and more, and we're seeing a lot more of this, right? Where people are actually purchasing animals direct from the cow-calf farm. They know the, the, um, the experience of those animals as far as vaccine and everything, and are decreasing their use of antibiotics. But until we start increasing that, we're still gonna see this antibiotic use at arrival at the feedlot because it's an insurance policy. Unfortunately, those antibiotics work too well right now and that is absolutely gonna change, but they work too well right now and you don't have um, regulations on not utilizing them. And so even if you say you vaccinated, I'm still gonna give it just, just in case. And so as veterinarians, we can really try to speak to our producers, our feedlot producers, really helping them understand the mechanism of disease, bring up some of these studies that we've done where we've looked at pre-vaccinated animals, um, help them feel more comfortable with the data that they are receiving as well. And on the and the flip side of that is I as a veterinarian have to feel comfortable with that as well. So, you know, on the cow calf side, we can do our best to vaccinate those animals and do a good job of it so that when someone sees your animals are vaccinated, they're going to feel comfortable with that particular um, recommendation as far as decreasing the use of, of antibiotics. Um, but I do think, unfortunately, some of it is probably end up going to have to be regulated to, to really get to really be able to get there. Okay, our next question. When using a live vaccine on open cows, how long before turning the bull out would you recommend vaccinating that cow? So ideally, you want to have um, them have that level of immunity prior to um, the turnout of the bull. So you'd wanna do that about two to four weeks before you turn the bull out. Uh, it is critical if you're using Modify Live, especially for the first time, that they can potentially be shedding some of that. So you absolutely don't wanna give it and turn them directly out with a bull. You want um, that shedding potentially can happen for about a week. And so you wanna make sure it's at least a week, ideally two to four weeks um, before you turn your bull out with um, MLV vaccinated cows. Next question, how many times, how many times would you say you can use a multi-use needle before you should switch needles? That's an awesome question. Um, and there's not a great answer. I would say 10 um, is sort of the max that we use in our practice um, and obviously changing more frequently as needed. When you look at a needle, the first time it is injected into an animal, there is actually um, structural change to that needle if you look at it under a microscope. And so, I mean, obviously it doesn't make sense to change every, every animal, but if you're changing every 10, that's a good, that's a good um, sort of middle ground to be. Next question, are, are lice getting immune to some of the porons? That is an amazing question and something that we're actually working on right now. So it really appears that we are seeing some resistance of lice um, to the porons, um, actually a fair bit of resistance and that's actually across country that we're seeing that. And so, uh, do we suspect that's what's occurring? Yes, we do. Um, do we have the absolute answer to that right now? No, we absolutely don't. But if we can get more, and, and that's something we're working on, like I said, and if we get more concrete information, then the that will move drug companies to develop some additional um, 
options for that as well. Next question, what's the price difference between vaccinated and non-vaccinated feeder calves? Yeah, that's a like that's a tough question to answer just because it is really market dependent um, as far as what the price difference tends to be and what type of sale that you're seeing in. So, you know, we have seen um, differences up to about 30 cents per pound, but you certainly wouldn't, you know, if you send your your animals through the general sale at Olax on Thursdays, like you don't expect to see that difference. So it's going to depend if you want to capture that dif difference, target those um, special pre-vaccinated sales, because that's where you're really going to see the best bang for your buck. Whereas through general sale market, you tend to not see any, in, any difference between the two. Next question, do, do assumptions about efficacy between vaccine brands or farmer pref preferences contribute greatly to the revaccination strategy? Yeah, I mean, so for example, the first vet that I worked for, um, he hated Triangle 9 because they had an issue way, way back in the day that they had some live product get in with their killed product and it caused um, abortion in those particular animals. So he would not recommend tri Triangle 9 no matter what. And some of the producers that experienced that same thing um, also won't use Triangle 9 or Triangle 10. You just don't get them to do it because they're, they're just not interested. Um, and so you got to use what works for you. We have lots of really great options, whether it be live, whether it be killed, there are lots of really great options. And if you personally feel that killed works better in your farm and you prefer Zoetis's killed product, then go for it. Because no matter what we're doing, it is always better than nothing. So yes, it does um, contribute to what people choose, absolutely. Um, and, um, you know, again, something is always better than nothing. And there's actually very little difference between the, uh, the different products from different companies. So go with whatever you feel is working best for you. Next question. If you already vaccinate your cows annually with a modified live virus at PregCheck, would there be any benefit to changing the vaccination of those cows prior to breeding? Yeah, that's a great question. And this really comes down to having the highest level of immunity at the ri highest risk time. And so that's why that MLV at the time of um, pre-breeding is sort of the gold standard recommendation um, because your highest level of immunity is going to be at that highest risk time of abortion. Um, if you're already on a program of MLV at PregCheck, you're happy with that program, you've not seen any problems with that MLV at PregCheck, I wouldn't change it um, because there is a really great saying in veterinary medicine, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You probably have the same saying in, in um, production as well. But um, is, the, is there a slight if you were going to start from scratch, is there a slight benefit to that pre-breeding time? Teeny, teeny, tiny. Is it worth changing what you're already doing? I would say no. Unless you're seeing problems, then just continue with what where you're going because that difference is going to be minuscule. Next question. Do you have any comments on the immune response from using a bolus for E. coli at time of birth versus vaccinating the cow for scours? Yeah, so this is also a really great question and it comes down to um, how good are your cows at um, bringing up that response, that immune response and putting the immunity into the colostrum. It's always better that they get immunity from colostrum. That's gonna be more, um, that's gonna be more effective always. Uh, but if you've got a situation where you have a little bit higher stress or something like that, then those E. coli um, at the time of birth can help um, help those animals be a little bit more resistant to the disease. The other thing is you can give both. You can give your cows um, the 
vaccine and also give the bolus there because it's not it's an antibody it's not an actual live vaccine there's no concern with both of them so if you feel like you're having a lot of um, scours then absolutely you can use that but generally speaking you're better off to vaccinate your cows um, you get better immune response through the antibodies through colostrum well that's all the time we have for questions and thank you again jessica and now we'll go back to katie